Hey everybody, this is Bradford Smith on behalf of Eat3D. and Today I'd like to share with you my workflow for getting color correct reference. Uh, it's going to be a very simple but very effective workflow using XWrite's Color Checker Passport in Adobe Lightroom. It's going to allow us to get very accurate um, but also very consistent reference data that we can continue to add to in a library. So let's dive in. So why is color correct texture reference important? Uh, you know, one obvious answer is going to be uh, physically based rendering. Uh, and while it's certainly not a new concept, its relevance these days in games has really brought to light the importance of accurate diffuse values. Uh, and simply going outside an overcast day is a great starting point. But we want to make sure that all these values are really accurate and corrected to some sort of standard. And more importantly, we also want them all to be relative. So no matter when we go out and shoot, or what we shoot, it's all corrected to the same standard and relative. So as a texture and environment artist, oftentimes I'm not just concerned with the contrast and the color relationships within one texture, but I'm usually concerned with those relationships across an entire scene or entire level. So it's important that my library be accurate but also consistent. So to better understand the correction process, let's quickly take a look at the correction layers and see what it is we're correcting for. So here's an image that I shot, uh, and I just brought it straight into Lightroom, as is. And it's not bad, but there's some room for improvement here. And if we look at the first layer of correction, we're essentially assigning a camera profile, which is going to correct the camera and lens's ability to render accurate colors under a given illuminant meaning this particular camera with this particular lens is going to achieve certain color characteristics under tungsten lighting and daylight and overcast lighting. And I want to make sure that the sensor is faithfully reproducing those colors. So we use camera profiles to get those colors correct. And the other layer of correction here is Lightroom's develop settings. I've simply just linearized them so that Lightroom by default isn't doing any image adjustments here. So I want to get as pure an image as possible. And the next layer here is going to be just a simple white balance and exposure adjustment. I want to make sure that the darkest patch and the brightest patch are the values that they need to be. And then as a photographer this is where I might start to do some creative contrast work and then even some color grading to get a look. But as a texture artist I want to get to that neutral raw original source. So let's take a look at that in a texture context. So here's an image down in my garage and this was an interesting exercise because I just went down there. I know I can't trust my spot meter or my matrix meter because it's going to read this as mid-gray. And so I just eyeballed it to see how close I could get. Uh, and this is just what I matched. And this is the camera response and lens correction. And then this is the linearization and then this is the white balance and exposure adjustment. So it becomes really clear that what I thought I was shooting actually wasn't what I was shooting at all. And of course I really don't need to blur it out and average it in order to see how off I was. But it's interesting if we actually just look at average luminance, which I'm mostly concerned with as a texture artist. I'm more concerned with value relationships than I am color relationships because it's very subjective and it's going to change as an art direction call. So if we linearize those values, then what we see is we're off by a pretty big factor here. So the implications, particularly if I need to you know, match a backplate or, or you know, really get a realistic look, uh, this texture is going to be way off. And the implications on the rest of my textures or compensation and lighting could be pretty big. So I want to make sure my reference is really, really accurate. So let's take a look at what type of equipment we would need to start shooting. When it comes to a camera body, there's really not too much we need. Most entry level DSRs will do. But we're going to need the ability to shoot raw images. We definitely want manual exposure control. This is a big one. I generally only shoot manual. And we're going to want the ability to shoot custom white balance if possible. Uh, that's kind of a nice to have, but it's certainly just a bit more accurate. Uh, but the most important thing when shopping for a camera is going to be the comfort. 
uh, you're going to be holding it. You're going to be looking for a lot of buttons. So you want to make sure that it's comfortable in your hand and you can reach everything you need to. Uh, and then a good LCD info readout and, and histogram and easy access to it is usually very important too because we're going to refer to that a lot. And when it comes to lenses, really the most important thing is just familiarization. So read up on reviews. Um, when it comes to shooting texture reference, I'm usually at 5.6 or f8, simply because that's where my lens is going to have the best performance. Everything's going to be nice and sharp. I'm not going to have a lot of vignetting or distortion. Uh, when we're stopped down like that, the, the quality is going to really be pretty good. So even an entry-level lens or kit lens is going to do fine. It doesn't have to be a very expensive lens. The other thing I recommend is shooting with common focal lengths. Uh, shoot the focal lengths where your lens performs the best. For me, that's 24 millimeter and 35 millimeter, and all my texture reference gets shot to those because I know how to correct for those. And then, of course, this is the Color Checker Passport by x -Rite. I love it because it's portable, it's accurate, <laughs> and it's also got a really good gray reference on the, on the back side of this uh, Color Checker matrix. So we can use that to set our custom white balance. Now, I've been asked before about circular polarizers, and my general take is that they're not worth it. <laughs> so you're going to experience at least a stop of light loss, which could impact your ISO and uh, noise quality. And it could affect your correction settings, too. And I really like to keep the correction process simple and straightforward. Uh, so, and unless you're cross-polarizing, so by that you're polarizing your light source and then linearly polarizing uh, at your lens as well, you're really not going to get the benefits. So for me, it's really not worth it. So a few shooting tips. We're going to want to definitely set the picture preset on our camera to neutral. So we don't want to use any landscape or vivid presets. We want as close to a raw image as possible. We're also going to want to set a custom white balance, if we can, using the gray reference card on the back of the matrix. And then we also want to start photographing the reference target in order to get our exposure. Uh, we simply just want to use the in-camera histogram to make sure that we're not clipping on either end. Because when we first create profiles from a reference image of this color checker target, uh, we want to make sure nothing is clipped. Otherwise, it won't create the profile correctly. And we'll see that a little bit later. So I'm often asked about settings. And what's more important here is an order of operations. Since light levels are going to vary across the board, uh, settings are pretty irrelevant. So for me, I'm always setting my aperture first. And like I said before, it's always going to be at 5, 6, or 8, because that's where my lens performs well. But I'm also not going to have a shallow depth of field. So I'm going to be able to get everything in focus that I need to. Um, good rule to follow uh, for shutter speed now is reciprocal focal length. Uh, so you generally don't want to go below 1 50th of a second or 1 60th of a second, uh, no matter what your focal length is. But if you start shooting longer focal lengths, like 85 millimeter, you probably don't want to go below 1 85th of a second. And that's basically to avoid camera shake and to ensure that we have nice, sharp images. And then when it comes to getting your exposure setting correct, the last thing that's left is ISO. And for me, that just gets set to the lowest acceptable value uh, based on your acceptable shutter speed. Uh, and that's basically just as low as you can get it so that you get the correct exposure, but you don't have a lot of noise. As far as software goes, I love Lightroom. It's great for you know, batch edits to a lot of RAW files, so we're going to be in there. I've also gotten really good results with Adobe's DNG Profile Editor. Uh, it is a little bit more advanced, uh, so I recommend x Color Checker Passport. We'll be looking at that today. It's really simple and it's very effective. So with that, let's dive into the demonstration. All right, so here we are in Lightroom. And I've got my camera NEF files in here, so I'm just referencing all my RAW files. And if we take a look in the develop module here, then what we've got is a really nicely exposed for image of my uh, color checker here. And it's well white balanced, so it's going to be a great source to generate a profile from. 
So to do that, we're going to go ahead and export as a DNG. And I've already got a path here that I can export them to. And with that, I can just open up Color Checker Passport. And now I'm just dragging in my DNG. Uh, so it's going to automatically look for all the patches for me and come up with a correction profile. And now I can just save them out. So I've already got a test one here. Uh, one thing that's important to note about the naming convention is I'm referencing the camera body as well as the lens and the lighting condition. So for every camera and lens combination that I have, I generally have four profiles, one for tungsten lighting, one for direct sun, and one for shade and overcast. And that's a pretty good starting point for a profile library. So let's go ahead and just overwrite this guy. Say OK. And now Color Checker Passport is telling me I need to restart Lightroom in order to see that profile. So let's do that. So now that we're back in Lightroom, let's go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the developing section. And we're going to look for camera calibration here. And now we should see our newly created overcast profile. And right away we're seeing much better color reproduction. So that's good news. Before I leave this camera calibration tab, I'm going to go ahead and set it to the 2010 process. And the reason for that is because it's going to be a lot easier to linearize this image in the older process engine than it's going to be the newer one. So we'll go ahead and set it to 2010. So let's close up that tab and work our way up. So looking in the lens corrections now, I'm definitely going to want to enable the profile corrections and make sure it picks up my lens information. And it got the rest from EXIF data there, so that's good. And I'm going to want to remove chromatic aberration as well. So we're going to enable all the nice corrections automatically. And we can close that up. And now let's take a look at the detail pane here. So I know that I was at a lower ISO. So looking up here in the info view, I've got about an ISO of 400. So I shouldn't need too much. And I don't want to go crazy with this. I want just enough to just get rid of some of that noise because I don't want to wash away the texture of the texture that I was shooting. So I'm going to do just enough to kind of get rid of some of that grain. Maybe even leave just a tiny bit of that grain there. So I'll probably set it at 20. And I really won't bother with any sharpening um, because this is really just for photo reference. Uh, so I don't really need to do any sharpening and create any contrast that wasn't really present. Uh, so I'm really done with the detail pane now. So the next one we want to look at is going to be the tone curve. So if we back up, we're definitely going to want to set this guy to linear. Uh, and right away we saw another big jump there. And the last section we want to set in order to linearize this image is going to be all these basic settings here. So we're going to want to make sure everything is zeroed out. The blacks, the brightness, and the contrast. So now we're looking at a nice linear image. And if we do a before and an after, you can kind of see where it was before we linearized it and did the corrections. And it's a pretty big jump. So all that's left now is to just do the final bit of correcting. And this is where it's usually pretty straightforward, but there's one little trick I'll show you. We're going to want to zoom in and take a look at some of these patches. We're going to want to start off by grabbing our white balance dropper here and just selecting one of these patches in order to get a nice gray balance here. Uh, and now that I've white balanced it, I'm ready to start looking at these luminance patch values. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the S key in order to enter soft proofing mode. And we want to make sure that our intent is in relative and that our profile is set to sRGB. Now what that's going to allow us to do is to be able to see these pixel color values in a 255 scale over here on our histogram. So you see as I move my mouse around, those values are updating over on the top right corner over here. So I know from experience that this value needs to be around 243 or 245 in the red channel, and this guy needs to be around 50. So those are always the first two I'm going to check. Uh, and we're a little bit low here, so I'm going to start off by raising my exposure, probably about 0.2 
and that's still a little bit low so let's go 0.3 and that's pretty good that's good enough and looking over here at the black it's a little bit high so now what I want to do is I want to look at some of my mid value patches and I should be at about 163 and 121 here and they're pretty close uh, so if I just raise my blacks up a tiny bit then I'm somewhere around 50, 163, and 121, so I'm right where I need to be. Now this guy needs to be around 85, and he's there. Um, and this guy about 201, and he's there as well. So this image is pretty well corrected right now. But it isn't always that easy. This patch here in particular can be a little bit troublesome sometimes. And when I run into situations where I need to fudge these values up or down, I like to come down into the tone curve palette and grab this little button here and what's going to happen is when I grab a pixel here and I push my mouse down and I start dragging up or down then what I can do is I can set a new target value for that pixel uh, so I can use this guy to really start fudging some of these values up and down in order to get them to where they need to be so he's a really great tool for quickly moving these patches to where they need to be but right now I really don't need to because he's pretty accurate so now I'm ready to quickly apply this to the rest of my images so I'll go ahead and shift select the rest of my images and say sync check all and synchronize and then from there I can pretty quickly go through the rest of them uh, now that I've got a good linear image that's fairly well white balanced all I need to do is zoom in on the color checker of each image, just double check its white balance, and look at the white patch, which is definitely over in this one. So I'm going to go ahead and set it back to zero. And we're just below, so maybe a value of like 0.1 would do. And that's close enough. That's certainly within a good margin of error. And here we're a little bit high on the black for some reason, so I might actually just bump him up slightly. And we're right about where we need to be with the rest of the patches. So that one I can call done. And then you can pretty quickly go through the rest of the images just by checking the white balance and each of those luminance patches. So while this process does require a little bit of initial setup, it's really, really easy. And to do a whole sequence of images, I can go through them within a matter of minutes now that I know what these values need to be. Um, and you can get any reference table off the internet or the color checker even comes with target values for these and you can use that as reference to sort of know where these values need to be now you notice that I didn't really worry too much about the color values and again that's because color is going to be far more subjective I'm really mostly concerned with value relationships and I'm going to change color as an art direction call anyway so uh, for me, having all the reference just calibrated to these luminance patches is good enough. But the color is still going to be very, very accurate because of the linearization and the camera profile we applied. It may not be 100% perfect, but at least all of our reference is consistent and it's very accurate. And it's a very simple process that really anybody can do. So have fun, enjoy shooting reference, and I hope you enjoyed this video.